Today, I want to talk to you about a seepage berm case history uh, that I was lead engineer on recently, and uh, we just wrapped up construction uh, about a year ago. Uh, and so pretty, pretty recent and uh, a lot of good information here. And so uh, we'll go through it. Uh, and then at the end, if there's any questions, uh, please let me know. So we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, so as far as what we're going to go over today, uh, as far as learning objectives, we're going to uh, identify some potential failure modes. Uh, if you haven't already, I'm assuming this is going to be an item, uh, you'll get a brief introduction to risk assessment. So, so we'll look at the potential failure modes on this particular project. Uh, we're going to look at some of the definable features of work uh, that were installed, uh, look at data evaluation and data collection, and then uh, explain the uh, inverted filter berm or seepage berm that we designed on this project, uh, the seepage collection and, and filter system that was put in. Um, also, another feature of this uh, phase of work was we had some slope instability issues, and so we addressed them. And so I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about them as well. Uh, and then we're going to get into instrumentation and the instrumentation that we installed on this project. Uh, and how uh, we did monitor and how we can uh, plan to monitor that uh, moving into the future. So, and then at the end, uh, probably the most important part of the fun part is we'll take a look at a few construction photos uh, of, of some of the activities that were installed. So, um, here is uh, just a general overview of the project. We've got a uh, six mile long uh, homogeneous earth fill embankment. Um, we've got a traditional uh, outlet works uh, here on this project, it's just a single conduit with an intake tower, uh, and it's a 13-foot diameter with a, a stilling basin located downstream. Um, we've also got a spillway there on the far left-hand abutment, 560-foot uh, wide, uh, uncontrolled OG weir. Uh, a couple of features to point out that uh, we'll bring up later on in the discussion is, is this project also had uh, what they call an inspection trench or a cutoff trench. Uh, and those, uh, it went from approximately station 68 over to around 168, so at this location and this location. So those are key locations uh, that we'll talk about in this project and the impacts uh, that had uh, on these potential failure modes. So when we're looking at potential failure modes, uh, the one um, that was the risk driving, primary risk driver for the phase one approach of this project was something called uplift and blowout. And so, uh, you can see the image there, uh, and it's a good representation of actually what we had on this project. Uh, you have an impervious fill embankment uh, with a confining uh, layer. In our case, it was a, a, a CL or CH material overlaying by a pervious sand layer. Uh, in our particular case, we had uh, a lot of coarse sands, even some gravels. Uh, and so what happens is you have a rising pool. Um, at some point upstream in the pool, uh, it intercepts its pervious layer uh, and then moves downstream. At some point, you may have some blockage uh, in that pervious layer, which um, makes that uh, pressure build up underneath that confining layer. And as you can see there, we would have rupture and then ultimately blowout. Uh, when you have that blowout, uh, BEP initiates a backward erosion piping. And so what would happen is, is you would have erosion continuing in that purpose layer that uh, until you reach the pool. Uh, so at that point, um, what you would have is the, the dam only supported by the confining layer. Ultimately, it wouldn't support that. You would have collapse of the embankment and then ultimately overtopping of the structure. So um, so that's that's the, the primary risk driver that I want to talk about uh, for, for these two locations, CBJ1 and CBJ2. Uh, the other uh, potential failure modes that we addressed uh, in this phase of work was uh, a couple ALARP options. Um, if you talk about risk assessments in this training, uh, you may briefly go over ALARP, but uh, ALARP is uh, as low as reasonably practical uh, when looking at it from USACE terms. So, hey, what what can we do to, to reduce the risk, uh, but not to the point where it becomes cost prohibitive? And so, uh, in looking at the outlet works and the upstream berm on this project, uh, we looked at the CLE or concentrated leak erosion uh, along the outlet works. And so if you look at the, uh, the third image here from the, uh, from the top here on the left, uh, that's a very good representation of CLE along a conduit uh, where you have some entry point up in the uh, pool uh, and it flows along the conduit. Um, as you'll find out uh, in embankment construction, uh, anytime you have a 
a penetration or any kind of structure within an embankment, um, it, it's always difficult to get really good compaction uh, against those areas. Plus, these are also high stress areas where cracking can induce. And so there's several different features uh, that can align to where you have a continuous crack uh, that could initiate that CLE. And so uh, I'll go into uh, what, we're, what we did there uh, to uh, eliminate that CLE along the conduit and then the other the other uh, potential failure mode uh, is a uh, is a failure or upstream um, uh, 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 slide failure that we had uh, that back in 2015 uh, and I'll go into more detail as far as what caused this and some of the issues but uh, we were able to make that an ALART measure and address that as well too in this in this project. Um, so PFM 4A and 4B, as you noticed earlier, I said the inspection trench uh, stopped here and here. And so uh, what ultimately ended up resulting was, was we had end around flow uh, around these that inspection trench. Uh, so that designated uh, the two locations for PFM 4A and 4B. So uh, just to give you an idea of where those are located. Uh, and then when we look at PFM 2 and 8, 2 is right here at the outlet works. And then eight uh, is a 2,000 foot long section here on the upstream side of the embankment uh, that we addressed uh, for the slope instability. So what were the definable features of work uh, for this project? So, you know, the, uh, the dam safety modification study uh, scoped several items. Uh, you can see that there on the right, that is an image uh, from the dam safety modification study and what they propose coming out of the mod study uh, that we would do, uh, that we would perform to address uh, the uh, seepage and uplift issues uh, there in seepage areas one and two. Um, we did slightly modify that, but the same concept is there through PED, and, and I'll go over that in more detail in the coming slides. Uh, but as far as seepage area one and two, some of those definable features of work were an inverted filter berm uh, overlaying. Uh, we overlaid that uh, over the top of a collection tra a trench. Uh, we put in a controlled seepage outlet, uh, such as a weir box, uh, and then we installed a bunch of new instrumentation, such as piezometers, uh, so that we could monitor uh, upstream and downstream of this collection trench. Uh, at the outlet works, uh, we installed a filter around the conduit um, so that we had some filtration uh, to prevent or to offset that potential for CLE. And then on the upstream berm, we did some excavation and removal of unsatisfactory material. Uh, we installed a support berm, and then we in, uh, reinstalled some embankment on that slope. Uh, it's just some other uh, miscellaneous work. Uh, we had some pipelines that we had to replace, but uh, won't be going into any detail beyond that other than there were several different associated features uh, beyond the failure modes that we addressed uh, within this uh, phase of construction. So uh, when we're looking at uh, on this one, uh, and I'll, and I'll tell each of you, you know, as you as you go into an embankment design, uh, this is this is some of the most critical information you can gain is is up front. Uh, so collecting as much of the as built data, hist uh, historical drawings, plan sheets, uh, design reports, whatever it may be, uh, so that you can get a better understanding uh, on the project itself. Uh, when it comes to geotechnical data, hey, are there are there historical boring sample data? Uh, maybe this historical testing on this particular one, uh, we were able to use historical testing uh, to advance our design rather than uh, get a new contract and, and have to do additional testing. So um, uh, if they're not already developed, I recommend you develop sections and profiles uh, to better uh, interpolate the subsurface materials. Uh, you want to determine your soil types. Uh, do you have a CL, an SCM, a CH, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, and then ultimately you want to put all this together, evaluate it, and determine if additional investigations uh, are needed to complete the design. In this particular case, uh, we did determine that we needed uh, some additional information, and so uh, we did a follow-on investigation once we collected this data. Uh, geology is important as well, too. So, hey, what are the formation types? In this particular project, we had a woodbine shell and an Eagle Fork clay shell. Uh, it was important to know where these uh, were on the project. Uh, one was a sandier type material, one was a, a higher plastic clay shell. So it was important to know uh, with the source material when we were particularly looking at borrow areas and how it impacted our design. 
uh, instrumentation, um, and you want to collect all the historical data, whether that's PZ readings, uh, relief well flow rates, um, you know, boring logs from instrument to instruments are, are another good source that you could use as far as geotechnical and, and tie that back into your uh, interpretations that you're um, performing for, for your particular project. Um, gather historical data for all types, piezometers, inclinometers, settlement PN, seepage collection flow, and much, much more. So, so uh, I want to jump into the first definable feature of work here, uh, which was the inverted filter berm. This is actually what was designed and constructed on this project. Uh, the top image there is a plan view. Uh, you can see we have uh, ramps here on the left, ramps on the right to construction uh, to construct an inspection road. Uh, and then on the bottom here is a section view. Excuse me where you can see the uh, inverted filter berm, the compacted fill overlaying. We got a blanket drain uh, here that we installed. Uh, by, uh, and then also we have a Seabus collection trench where I'll go into much more detail. Uh, then we have a foundation drain here on the end to collect any water that might bypass our seepage collection trench. So we put in a two stage uh, with a pipe seepage or uh, uh, foundation drain here uh, one key I'll also mention here that we did on this project, and this is something uh, that's important when, when looking at historical data is, is uh, you know, this, this portion of the embankment had uh, an existing blanket drain in it. And so, excuse me, we just didn't want to seal off that, uh, that um, existing blanket drain. So what we did is we went in and uh, tied this new uh, blanket drain into it. So there's critical features that you need to know. Uh, and try to determine the location and extents. Uh, we actually had to do an investigation on this to determine the extents of that blank, uh, existing embankment drain, but it was critical that we did that to make sure it was all one system when we were done. So, you know, as far as looking at the inverted filter berm and some of the des uh, design analysis we did, uh, when looking at the design height, where we started out was with our piezometers. Uh, and the design height was based on the probable maximal uh, uh, flood pool. And so um, you can see an image there where we took one particular instrument, uh, we plotted uh, uh, the, uh, the elevation versus pool, uh, and then we did a projection. Obviously, we on this uh, particular project, uh, we've gotten nowhere near the uh, PMF event. So we had to come up to one way uh, to determine, well, hey, what, what could be our potential maximal uplift potential. And so that's where we did our projection uh, on that. And I will say there's a there's a line of caution here. Make sure that uh, some of your more experienced folks, design engineers are taking a look when you're doing these interpolations. So, uh, because they can be grossly overestimated. And so uh, just make sure someone is peer reviewing that information, but not knowing, you know, what the PMF event level will be, we need to go ahead and um, use safe policy required that we design for that. Uh, and so that was the reason for that projection there. Um, another thing that we looked at was historical uh, seepage area footprint. Uh, you can see there in the image, uh, we've got some seepage there. This was after the pool record event. Um, and you'll see a ring dike of sandbags there. We actually had a sand oil pop up uh, uh, during the uh, uh, pool of record. And so uh, taking information like that uh, and putting it all together as far as looking at your piezometer data to determine uplift and then looking at your footprint kind of gives you a general idea of, of your focus point. And then you refine your design to ultimately determine uh, the limits of your filter burn. So, um, so in addition, uh, we did some additional investigations, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, some of those were we did an aquifer pump test. We knew we were going we were going to be uh, needing dewatering on this just based on historical observations in the area. Uh, so we did an aquifer pump test using uh, existing instrumentation. Uh, we did some ground penetrating radar to locate existing utilities and infrastructure in the area. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we did an investigation to look at the blanket drain. Uh, while we were out there at the aquifer pump test, uh, that particular contractor had the equipment and means to clean and map uh, existing collection systems. I, I highly recommend this uh, when you're working on a, an existing structure. Um, you know, cleaning these uh, increases the efficiency 
Uh, and ultimately on this project, we determined that there were some drains that were plugged. And so once we unplugged them, uh, they began to flow. And so uh, matter of fact, that drain was left in place uh, because we knew that it was still functioning. So there was no need to tear it out if we didn't have to. Uh, then, as I mentioned, um, we did some additional geotechnical investigation. And one of the areas I want to focus on is right here. Um, the green is a confining layer, which is, consists of CL and CH materials. Uh, and then the brown zone there is, is our uh, pervious layer. Uh, and so as you can tell, based on this cross section, we have a fairly thick confining zone. And then you get to these stations here, uh, and then it really narrows up. And so uh, right in this area here is where you saw the ring dike for the sand boils. Uh, that's, where, that's where that occurred during that pull of record event. So we knew that this was our focal point, uh, and this is where we took off as far as uh, looking at the footprint of our inverted filter burn. So we also did some seepage analysis. So uh, we utilized uh, GeoStudio CW. Uh, we did a simplified model. This was a very complex stratigraphy uh, on this uh, particular project. So we kept it fairly straightforward, uh, the gray zone being the shale, the brown being the pervious sands, and then the green being the confining layer. So, um, so we went uh, well beyond the downstream limits just to make sure our model didn't limit us uh, in, in projecting those uh, uplift uh, potential that we could have. Also, we looked at uh, flow rates on these seepage uh, models as well. Uh, one of the key features with these seepage models is, is, is we ran a calibration at a lower pool, at a known pool uh, that we had data that could support uh, and calibrate our model. And then we bumped our model into the PMF and let it tell us what that free edit line would do uh, in the event we were to have a PMF event. So, so calibrating your model is another key feature to denote uh, if you have a historical data that can support that. Um, as far as uplift analysis, so uh, we use the uh, projected free attic lines, as I mentioned earlier, when looking at historical PZ data. Um, we had confidence in our confining layer and material properties because of those additional investigations. Um, and then you say guidance uses effective stress here. And so per EM 1110-1901, it states that we have to have a factor of safety of three at the toe and a factor of safety of 1.5 at the, inverted, at the uh, inverted filter burn toe. Excuse me. Um, and so you can see that equation there. And so ultimately, um, so you're looking at the buoyant weight of the confining layer, uh, which in this case would be our CLCH material. And then we would have the, the thickness of the confining layer, uh, and then the unit weight of water, and then the differential head, uh, piezometric head from where you're analyzing it to the pool elevation. And so uh, ultimately what we determined, we did our initial calc looking at that confining layer and determine that, hey, we need additional berm height. And so uh, what we did, uh, uh, we need additional berm height to meet those factor of safeties there. And so uh, we started increasing T. Um, so we encompassed the confining layer that was out there and then started increasing that based on the amount of berm that we would be adding onto this area. And so we kept adding additional height until we measured those factors of safety. Uh, and so, uh, but that, that was the process that we went through to determine the ultimate height uh, that we needed for this filter berm to offset uplift. So to transition out of the filter berm into the uh, seepage collection system, uh, the image here on the left is a, is a copy from the, uh, the construction plans. Uh, we had a three foot uh, zone of uh, blanket filter, uh, which was C33 fine ag. Uh, and then we have a seepage collection trench, a two-stage seepage collection trench with a fine ag and a coarse ag, and then uh, an 18 inch diameter perforated conduit. And then we have a new uh, feature here. Um, you may have not seen or heard before, but uh, we call it a vertical filter drain. And so here on the right, you can see what that looks like from a top view. Um, we have a four foot diameter circle with an 18 inch uh, diameter uh, inner circle with coarse ag, and those are on 10 foot centers. And so uh, I'll go into more detail. Actually, I think the next slide here. So so the goal here was uh, designed to allow a pathway from a lower elevation uh, to a higher elevation. So uh, the thought was, was we would intercept some of those seepage flows that were flowing right against that shale interface 
uh, and we would have a way for them to be moved and, and then intercepted and, and brought to the surface uh, into our conduit and transported to a safe outlet. So I think one of the key things to point out here is, is um, some of you may have seen continuous filter uh, trenches. Um, really, uh, this wasn't needed on this particular feature because we had the berm in conjunction with this. We didn't feel like there was a need to have a continuous cutoff or a filter trench there. Uh, so it's fully expected that seepage will continue to migrate downstream. However, what we've done is, is that we've uh, reduced our gradient potential. Uh, as you can see there, we've, we've reduced the gradient because we've increased or we've added our berm, which increases the length uh, when looking at our gradient. And then we reduced the hydraulic head potential uh, that would offset uplift, but not only installing the seepage collection trench and vertical filter drains, but also the overburden weight of that infer inverted filter berm. So as I mentioned earlier, this was a two-stage filter design. Uh, we made sure that the fine ag was compatible with the in-situ materials uh, and that the coarse ag uh, would handle the uh, seepage flows uh, that we determined from the aquifer pump test uh, and that they were also compatible with the fine ag. So um, as far as the, uh, the vertical filter drain just continue here, we utilize CW. Uh, we utilize it as if we were designing a relief well system. Uh, and so the outside diameter, uh, as I mentioned, was four foot. We wanted to make sure that we, we had enough annulus space between the core sag uh, and the outer edge of the fine ag to make sure that if we got off alignment when we were placing that core sag, that it didn't come in direct contact with those in situ materials uh, because uh, we, would, did, we didn't want to be able to move material, in situ materials through the core sag. So we wanted to make sure that we had that filter medium there of the C33 fine ag. Uh, when it comes to compactive effort for those vertical filter drains, we flooded the core sag uh, and then the, or flooded the fine ag, excuse me. And then when it comes to the core sag, uh, really we were just placing that and we vibrated in place just to make sure that we didn't have any uh, uh, heaving uh, when we were placing that. I'll show some photos that'll, that'll better represent uh, what we did there on the core sag placement. Uh, as I mentioned, as far as the installation, uh, I'll go into much more detail here and it'll make more sense uh, when we look at the construction photos as far as how we put in these vertical filter drains. Uh, the seepage collection trench, uh, so the trapezoidal shaped, uh, and the reason for that is, and this is something you're probably going to learn this week in this class, uh, is we, we laid it back on a slope. Uh, when you lay it back on a slope, you increase that slope length which allows you potential to uh, intercept additional seepage uh, rather than just a vertical trench uh, that you commonly see. And so uh, we also put a two-stage filter there as well. Uh, that was C33 fine ag and C33 number nine coarse ag. Uh, we looked at filter compatibility. I know this is a, uh, I think Amanda is teaching this later this week. Uh, really key feature when looking at filter design. Uh, there's a couple of different references that I utilized uh, on this project. Uh, EM 1901 for the core and then USDA NRCS uh, engineering, uh, National Engineering Handbook Chapter 26. So uh, you just want to look, we looked at the filter compatibility between in situ and fine and then fine and coarse. Uh, one of the challenges with this project is, is we had some very fine in situ materials when you just ran straight compatibility calcs. Um, uh, the uh, calcs would tell you that your um, C33 fine ag was still too coarse for the in-situ uh, uh, fine materials. So what we did is uh, worked with uh, NRCS and they had a lab and they still had uh, some of Sherrard's, uh, some equipment uh, that Sherrard's no erosion filter test was based on. And so uh, we ran this particular test using the, in, the fine in situ materials against the C33 fine agar and determined that over time uh, the, fine ag, the C33 fine ag would eventually seal against those finer in situ materials. So that allow, allowed us to reduce our number of stages and only go with two. I will say this as a lesson learned is, is if you get much more than two, uh, I've seen two up to three um, filter designs, uh, they can become more complex. Uh, as far as uh, construction and, and building those in the field. As far as compactive effort, uh, we did 100% max dry density uh, according to ASTM D698. Uh, this was a uh, process that Danny McCook developed 
and ultimately determine this is approximately 70% relative density. It's a good fill technique because uh, ASTM D698 is what you do for compacted fill um, in looking at your compaction there. So it's a relatively um, straightforward test that the labs and others know. Uh, core sag, uh, we looked at 40% relative density uh, when, when we were uh, placing that material. I think the big key or big takeaway here on filter placement during construction is, is, is make sure that you're not overly compacting. Um, if you do over compact, uh, you have the chance of breaking that material down, which thus uh, reduces your uh, filtration and then also significantly reduces uh, your permeability, which could actually do more harm than good, uh, depending on where this material is being placed. Uh, Seba's collection trench uh, design analysis. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we did an 18 inch uh, perforated profile wall pipe. Profile wall being that we had a smooth interior and a corrugated exterior. Uh, we utilized our aquifer pump test that we use for our dewatering design. We took those uh, conductivity, hydraulic conductivity values, looked at the flow rates, and that's ultimately what we uh, designed this conduit off of. We looked at some Bureau of Rec standards um, and based on that, uh, max flow depth within your pipe uh, is a quarter of the pipe diameter. The key with designing conduits for filter systems is, is that you don't want to get pr pressurized flow. Uh, so that's the reason for, for having that reduced um, depth uh, within your conduit. So it builds in some additional factor of safety. Uh, we did perforations on this pipe. Um, and so you can see the equation there. It's a coefficient times the area. Uh, times your gravitational constant uh, divided by the head uh, of the of the water in, or entering the pipe. Uh, the entrance coefficient we used here is 0.67. That is key uh, to the uh, perforation design as it can have significant impacts uh, to how you uh, to the size and, and how many perforations you need. Uh, the key here is making sure your perforations are compatible with the material that goes up against the pipe. Uh, we also did a structural analysis, um, and that was one of the benefits of the, the Contact A2000 is, is by these corrugations, uh, we had some additional ring strength uh, that we could rely on when placing these uh, where we had significant fill over the top. These red circles here are, are highlighting the perforations. Uh, there was actually three quadrants, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, two rows uh, of these, and uh, this is actually in the stockpile. We actually placed these on the bottom side when we put them in the trench. Uh, that way, as soon as water got to that location, it was entering the pipe and going downstream to the outlet section. Um, so we did a traditional wear box design, uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, we, we put in some stainless steel V-notch weirs so that we could measure flow uh, coming out of our seepage collection system. So, uh, so a couple of takeaways when it comes to seepage collection trench and, and uh, construction. Uh, test sections are key anytime you're putting in a blanket filter or a seabus collection trench. You want to be able to understand uh, the contractor's processes and approaches. So, so test fields are a must. Uh, the trapezoidal section uh, um, can be difficult to construct. Um, uh, what I would say here is let your contractor use their imagination to how they can make it work and be efficient for them. Um, we call them bat wings. They weld some bat wings on a, a track hole bucket and we're able to cut that um, uh, trapezoidal section quite well uh, on this project, and it worked out really well. Um, the other key takeaway or lesson learned on Louisville was maintaining existing instrumentation. Um, you want to maintain existing instrumentation as long as you can until it absolutely has to be removed. Um, a valuable lesson learned was as we took instrumentation out too early on this project, and uh, we could have utilized it to monitor rising pool elevations uh, to determine what impacts it might have on our construction zone. So uh, here's just a, a simple image of our two weir boxes uh, that we put on this particular project. So pretty straightforward, couple bays, uh, V-notch weirs uh, between 20 and 30 degrees uh, that uh, the uh, operation staff could monitor and, and measure those flows. So as far as the outlet works, um, what we've got going on here is on the left image here is our excavation limit. You can see here, uh, there wasn't any existing instrumentation on this project. So we went in and installed some new posometers, some observation wells, so that we can monitor any potential water in the area around the, uh, around the conduit uh, for future cases. 
Um, this is a, a cross-section image to show, you know, what we actually did. You can see the, uh, the conduit here. Uh, these little bumps here in the conduit are seepage collars. These are uh, an old means of, of trying to increase the seepage path. Uh, they determined long term after after installing these all over the country that they weren't that effective. Uh, but ultimately, what we uh, but what we did is we come in here and installed a seepage collection trench around those uh, seepage collars uh, so that in the event we had water. Uh, transmitting along this pipe that we would intercept it here, provide filtration, and then provide a safe outlet uh, through the, the wall of the stilling basin. Uh, so as far as the outlet works design analysis, uh, the, the primary objective was to provide a filtered exit to prevent CLE. Uh, we did some slope stability uh, calcs using uh, GeoStudio. Uh, one of the key observations during this project was we need to make sure that Either the contractor has a geotech engineer or, or USACE has a competent engineer as well on site to monitor the excavations as they're being made. Uh, we actually had to make some design changes here because we got into the excavation there behind the, the conduit and determined that we hit a sand land, so that changed our stability. So we had to do some additional calcs and actually had to lay that slope back a little differently. Uh, it presented some challenges because we're on the tallest portion of the embankment. So the further you go into the embankment, the higher you have to go into the embankment for that slope to cut out. Uh, and that's something we didn't want to do. So that presented its own challenges as well. Uh, we did filter compatibility uh, and perforated conduit uh, designs here as well. As I mentioned, we installed observation wells uh, so that we can monitor flow uh, and remove any uh, standing water in those areas if we needed to for long term. Um, some takeaways on this when you look at construction is is consider construction techniques when designing you've all heard at some point in time in your career and if not you will hear that everything looks good on paper uh, this is one of those instances where uh, i'll jump back up this this vertical section looks pretty straightforward here uh, but uh, in construction it presented its own challenges because uh, it was a confined area and it made it difficult to excavate um, and so, uh, so those are some challenges there. Uh, and then be, be, be always beware and cognizant of working around an outlet works. There's, there's typically a lot of utilities, a lot of different infrastructure. Uh, you're also working typically on the tallest portion of the dam. Uh, so really when you're looking at overburden and slope stability, those are all key items that you need to, need to be paying attention to. Uh, upstream berm, uh, this is a cross section of what we did here on the upstream side. Um, we uh, removed a, a, a section of the embankment, uh, put in some new fill, uh, placed some new rock, and uh, built a coffer dam. This was uh, this is the area of interest. Uh, it was a 2,000 foot long section that we constructed this berm here. So, um, so as far as slope instability, we looked at EM 1122-1902. Um, this is a known area to have historical slides. The most recent one uh, was 2015. And the reason for this was, was uh, this portion of the embankment was constructed out of the excavation from the auxiliary spillway. Uh, the parent material for that is the Eagle Four clay shell. It's known to be a very high plastic uh, CH material. And so uh, in this part of North Texas, uh, you have wetting and drying cycles. And so desiccation cracking is, is prone in this area. So what happened in this particular event is, is we had a dry spell that had significant rainfall. So we uh, had a tension crack develop, we filled it full of water, ultimately we lost strength, uh, and then that was part of the reason for the significant slide. So, so um, to help us in that, we did historical test data. We uh, again utilized slope W. We replicated a failure by putting that tension crack in there, filling it full of water to see if we could replicate what actually what we saw in the field. Uh, per policy, we did an end of construction uh, stability, and we also did a rapid drawdown. Um, the coffer dam design was pretty straightforward in that we took bedding and riprap material from the embankment uh, and, and built a, uh, the coffer dam. And so uh, we needed that coffer dam to pr protect our area of construction uh, during, the, during an elevated pull event. So of all the features we worked on in this project, this was the only one on the upstream side. So as you can imagine, this was always um, on our minds as whether or not if it rained, was the pool going to come up and impact our uh, our construction area. So the coffer dam was key uh, for this effort. 
Um, we all did. So, we also did some lime treatment uh, to reduce the plasticity of these uh, this clay material. Uh, for this particular project, we use a pelletized quick line. Uh, we utilized uh, ASTM D6276 uh, to determine the alkaline line content. It was determined on this project that 4% was where we needed to be. Uh, we performed numerous triaxial shear strengths, both on the lime amended and untreated samples. And then uh, we performed several unconfined compression strengths. Uh, the image here on the right uh, is just an example of, of the, the different cases. We didn't do seismic on here, but when you look at sudden drawdown, into construction, flood loading, uh, those were the different failure modes that we looked at on this particular uh, phase of project. Um, as far as repair gradation and placement, uh, we did reuse uh, portions of the existing uh, embankment. There was still sound rock, so we still restockpiled or stockpiled it and then reused it. Uh, we installed new bedding and new rep wrap in those areas where we didn't have enough of the existing rock. As I mentioned, we constructed a cofferdam three foot higher than the conservation pool, so we had three foot of freeboard that we could utilize during construction. Um, as far as some takeaways, uh, we we're very fortunate that we didn't have any extended delays, none at all, on the upstream side. Uh, so, so that was that was a good thing. We had some unexpected subgrade uh, downstream of the cofferdam. We had some rocks. Uh, we had to work around that. Um, consider rip uh, riprap reuse. Uh, this was a conflict we ran into with the contractor in that. Um, if you're going to reuse rock, you need to have criteria in the specs that specifically lays out um, regrading that material and how you want to put it back on the embankment. So uh, during design, uh, consider access points. Access was very difficult throughout. Uh, so as far as, you know, where the ramps are placed, how does construction equipment get down? You can only have so much equipment on the upstream side. So uh, it became a challenge at some points with the contractor and, and getting all the equipment they needed in there uh, to complete this phase. Um, the Peloton's line can be uh, very difficult to hydrate. Um, and uh, but one of the keys is, is making, mixing and hydration is key to ensure that we get that lime embedded within those high plastic materials, thus reducing uh, the plasticity of those and ultimately reducing the desiccation and potential for shrink swell of those materials. Uh, instrumentation, I'll go over this pretty quickly. We installed automated instrumentation. That's what the dash lines are here. Uh, during construction, we had settlement pins in the embankment. We had inclinometers in the embankment. So we were just continually monitoring the embankment during construction anytime we had an open excavation down here uh, so that we could monitor and make sure that we never had any slope stability issues or instability issues uh, throughout construction. So uh, we created upstream to downstream. This is really a key feature here. When looking at piezometers, we have piezometers all the way from the crest of the embankment uh, all the way through and downstream of our seepage collection trench. What that allows us to do is develop a phreatic profile from the pool uh, over our seepage collection trench and, make, and seeing if we have that expected drawdown on our downstream piezometers. And so it's critical to develop those upstream to downstream profiles. As I mentioned earlier, we installed some wear boxes, uh, but in addition, we put automatic transducers in there so, um, so the uh, field ops staff can, uh, can automatically transfer those over and take a look and see if flows are fluctuating uh, by sitting there in the office. Uh, inclinometers, as I mentioned, we had those installed for slope stability, settlement pins, same thing. Uh, as I mentioned, maintain existing instrumentation. Any takeaway I have for instrumentation is, is, is keep it as long as you can until they absolutely have to remove it. Um, and then uh, coordinate with dam owner to ensure automation aligns with operation maintenance practices uh, and existing systems. Uh, there's numerous uh, softwares that are out there that can conflict and not align with maybe existing softwares they have out there. And uh, there may be some operators that, that don't like the automatic instrumentation. Maybe they still like having uh, folks go out and, and manually read those uh, rather than, than trusting on uh, an automated system. So, so that gets us through the, uh, the design phases. I've got a few minutes here, and I'll, I'll run through the construction photos here. I'm going to go ahead and dial these up. So this was the vertical filter drain. The contractor chose to do a means and method approach here. Uh, on So what they're doing here on the far left picture here is, is 
Uh, the contractor chose to install a five foot diameter surface casing. The surface casing ranged in depth anywhere from five to 10 feet in height. I'll show you where this really came into play uh, as to the reason why they did this. So they installed the surface casing and then once the surface casing was installed, uh, they went down hole with their four foot diameter uh, drill pier, uh, traditional drill pier equipment. Uh, and so once we got to the bottom of the hole, they took a clean out bucket, cleaned the bottom of the hole, we inspected the hole. Uh, we looked at alignment. We had alignment criteria in our specs. Once everything checked out, they lowered our uh, central pipe. Uh, this was a conduit that we were going to put our core sag. Uh, you can see here that they put some spacers here that so we can make sure that uh, this central pipe was located uh, centrally within the casing here of this drilled shaft. Uh, once it was in place, you can see here the core sag. You can see the fine ag here in this annulus. So at this point, the vertical filter drain was complete. Uh, so what the contractor did is they, they hooked uh, uh, here, they hooked a crane on this particular inside pipe. Uh, they extracted it uh, with a crane. And then once it was removed, then they used this uh, big hydraulic like ram. It's called an oscillator. Uh, they could grab onto this casing and extract each sex in the casing, excuse me, out of the ground until, until the hole was completed. So... So uh, a multi-step process. Um, it took it took a while to to get to um, uh, to an efficient state, uh, but once they got moving, uh, they were able to do a couple of these in a day. And so uh, so um, overall, the contractor did a did a good job here. So as far as a seepage collection trench, so um, so imagine this being existing ground, and you would see the surface casing sticking up here. And so what the contractor did is they would go in and excavate around the surface casing. And then once they got this excavated out, they would remove the surface casing. So the purpose for the surface casing was to keep from contaminating this uh, filter material that they just installed in these vertical filter drains. So you can see here now where they're progressing in the, drain, in the trench, they got some covers over their drains to protect them, to keep them from getting contaminated from surrounding materials. Um, here is a, a really... Uh, I'm, I'm proud of this image as a lead engineer. You can see this, it turns out almost exactly like you, what picture is, is we got a, a nice circle here, a fine ag with an 18 inch diameter of coarse ag in the middle. And then we're gonna tie that in with our seepage collection trench uh, as it comes down through here. Uh, this is a nearly completed trench. You can see our fine ag, coarse ag, manholes that we had built into the project, our seepage collection conduit. And then here is we're, we're nearing the finished state. Actually, the contractor here is putting on the blanket filter, which is on top of the seepage collection trench. Um, and so, um, so pretty much wrapping up from that phase. Uh, you can tell from the patterns here, the contractor used a double, a double drum roller uh, to place this material here. So, as far as weir boxes, pretty straightforward as far as concrete uh, construction. You can see forming here. Uh, and then you can see the finished product here. We have conduits coming into these bays. Uh, we got our, our uh, uh, weir plates here uh, that we can go up and monitor flows. Um, and then this is just a, a close up of the weir plate and the pipe coming through. Um, you can see here, it's, it's, it's not very definable here, but we have some, some wires coming down. Those automated transducers are actually located within the pool here of each of these weir boxes. So, so. The, uh, the outlet works, um, this is where I was talking about how uh, it was challenging during construction about the vertical sections. Uh, so um, we couldn't get nobody down in this uh, due to safety reasons, uh, trench safety. Uh, so we end up placing this in lifts uh, and flooding it. So you can see the contractor here. Uh, we just got through placing the lift and now they're going in and flooding it uh, and utilizing flooding for compaction in this confining zone. You can see we're coming back out of that trench. You can see these seepage collection collars uh, that I was talking about earlier, uh, contractors utilizing a skid steer. Uh, one of the things to think about when you're building your specs is, is um, uh, the double drum roller wouldn't be allowed in this area because we have restrictions that they couldn't be within three to five feet of a, of a permanent structure. So uh, all of this was done with uh, sand plates or hand compactors. Uh, so the level of effort increases when you're around these uh, these structures like this. So, uh, final slide. Um, 
So when looking at photos here, this is on the upstream work. Uh, you can see uh, our cofferdam here and some new rock that just placed. Uh, you can see where they're uh, doing some moisture conditioning here. Um, they, they've run through here with a disc and uh, get ready to compact this zone. You can see this dozer here is placing bedding material. Uh, you can see that this is a lighter material here. So this is our lime treated material uh, that we had a one foot thick zone here that would help maintain the moisture of this uh, embankment material plus uh, reduce the desiccation cracking or plasticity. Uh, this is the lime garden that the contractor utilized. Um, and so you can see the mixing equipment here in the background, but what that looks like. Uh, so they would pick this up and then transport it and then uh, spread it out here. Uh, wrapping up the berm here, you can see we're, we're bringing up the rock here on the surface. So uh, lime tree to fill, bedding material, and rock riprap. So we tied all that in and, and uh, cleaned that up. So, uh, um, so I think uh, I think that gets through the construction photos. As far as what we learned today, hopefully you guys uh, have some takeaways here. Um, so whether that's from identifying potential failure modes, you may have failure modes on your current projects or future projects where you're looking at CLE, slope instability, uh, or looking at uh, backward erosion piping. Uh, what are some of the definable features of work? So maybe if you're reviewing a project, um, you're understanding, hey, what are those critical features that impact, uh, that have impacted design and will ultimately impact construction and whether or not those risks have been reduced. Uh, data evaluation, data collection, uh, you have a good understanding that's that's really key uh, to starting a design. Um, inverted filter burn design, we kind of went through that, determining the thickness. Uh, we looked at uh, filter compatibility. Uh, we looked at uh, um, conduit design, uh, all different phases that are associated with seeps collection. We looked at slope stability. We looked at the different techniques, whether it's in the construction, rapid drawdown, seismic. We took a look at that and then the instrumentation, all the different instrumentations that can be installed. Uh, when you can remove them, when it's good to leave them in place for monitoring. And then here at the end, we took a look at some of the construction photos uh, from the project. So with all that being said, um, that's all I had this afternoon, and hope you all have a good rest of your training. So thank you all.